six years ago I published this book, Plutopia, uh, and it's a story of the first cities in the world to produce plutonium. And they produced a lot more than plutonium. They produced big environmental catastrophes and you know, re recalibrated our landscapes, militarized them and, and sullied them in ways that we have yet to fully digest. Um, and I, I learned as I started this story that both, both places, uh, the Hanford plant in eastern Washington and the Mayak plant in Siberia emitted about 350 million curies of radioactivity into the environment. And, you know, that's just like a, a lot of radioactivity, a lot of destructive energy. Um, and I wondered about that as I started that project, like, how did that happen? Um, you know, these aren't small bomb labs, these are big factories and tens of thousands of workers went through them over the four decades of production of plutonium. I was like, why didn't anyone say anything? You know, here they are, these workers, they're going to work and they're watching, you know, radioactive emissions go up the stacks and into the river and into the ground. And these are environments in which they lived, where their families lived. And all I could find was like a couple of KGB agents who spoke up in 1967 and, and, and said, hey, wait a minute, there's some, something awful that's going on here. Everybody else kept silent. And I, I couldn't really figure out what that was about. And as I started to work on this book, I, I realized that both of these you know, massive um, plants had one feature, and well, many features in common, but one specific feature is that they both had these limited access cities where plant workers lived. And, um, and I found that all these, these big important generals and, and engineers who were building the world's first nuclear reactors um, were also, you know, they were interested in, of course, in, 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 re in reactors and, and processing plants, but they also spent a lot of time in their correspondence talking about frozen chickens, softball games, and bus services. And, and I realized that the, the focus was in what I, this word I created, making plutopia nice. These are plutonium utopias. And if they could have these, these beautiful towns um, where working class uh, people were paid and lived like their professional class bosses, that bought a great deal of patriotism and loyalty, submission and silence. And um, so, so that was the solution to making plutonium was to in, employ the nuclear family and put them in these atomic cities. And that's how, um, why I think that these disasters could occur because, you know, big part of these, the Hanford plant, the disasters, there weren't a lot of big accidents. And the same thing in the Russian plant, they just did this as part of the daily operating order was to spill these hundreds of millions of curies into the environment. These were disasters by design. Um, and so as I worked this story and, and, and wrote about these plutopias, um, I met a lot of people um, and I met a lot of farmers because you have to, when you have a plutonium plant, um, you know, 101 for building a plutonium plant is put it someplace where there's a lot of water and secondly, put it in a place where there's not a lot of people. So these were sparsely populated territories with mostly farmers living around them. And the farmers would, you know, in Eastern Washington and in Siberia would tell me the same stories about their family health problems. And, and they would talk about this whole bouquet of health problems that they had, and, and, and cancers and birth defects, but also autoimmune disorders and endocrine problems and uh, cardiac and digestive tract problems that ran through their families. This guy, uh, uh, Tom Bailey, was one of my informants. And, and he told me the, the, these crazy, crazy stories. And, and I just thought, you know, he's a conspiracy theorist. He's listening to too much midnight radio. But as I worked my way through the archives over about six years, everything Tom told me panned out in the archives. Um, and Tom ha has a family riddled with cancers, and Tom was told when he was 18 that he was infertile. Um, and he introduced me to this woman who, who kept sort of a map um, about all the farmers in the area around them. And I had a grad student um, put the map and run it on Google Maps. And, and, uh, and this is what, you know, what she says is a death or illness. And, and you can see over there the chemical processing area, and that's the Columbia River going right down there. On the other side is this upslope. And so the, the winds from the stacks would hit that hillside. And, uh, and I showed it to the farmers in eastern Washington. They said, yeah, that's the death mile. We've known about that forever. Um, and in Siberia, the similar stories of, of people telling me about their, their health records. Um, 
So, I, you know, I, I wrote about that problem in, in Plutopia, and I wrote about that phenomenon, but I couldn't really get too many health records because these were military sites and they were behind cyclone fencing. And, and I found, especially in the American case, that the people who ran Hanford weren't terribly curious about what was going on outside of the nuclear reservation. So they didn't really monitor, they didn't inquire how people were faring who were farming uh, these fields right downwind from the plant. So I thought, you know, I, I know Russian, I'm, I was trained as a Soviet historian, I was trained here at, at <coughs> UW. Uh, and one of my advisors, Glennis Young, is here, and another one, John Taves, is here. And, um, and so I thought, well, you know, maybe I'll go check out the, the Chernobyl records and see if I find anything. And so I did what historians do. I walked into the archives in Kiev, and I asked the archivists if they had any uh, health records from the Ministry of Health on Chernobyl. And the archivists laughed at me. They said, you stupid American woman. That was a banned topic during the Soviet period. You won't find anything. But I knew these ladies. Uh, I, I'd worked there before, and I knew they didn't like to get off their stools. So I said, well, why don't I just go over here and look at the finding aids and see what I find? And, and it, it didn't take much of a researcher. In a couple of seconds, I found whole document uh, collections entitled The Medical Consequences of the Chernobyl Disaster. And sort of a Klondike of records. And I sat down, and I thought, I'm going to be at this for years, reading these records. Um, and I realized that these archivists weren't trying to lie to me. That's just that nobody had ever asked for them before. And archivists don't really read files, they just pull files. So if a, a historian hadn't come in and asked for those records, they presumed they didn't exist. And I went on and I worked in 27 archives for this project. Um, we went, I, worked, I had a couple of research assistants and we uh, started at the federal level and we worked down to the state and the county level and we got down to the county hospital records. And, um, it was a sort of colossal amount of documentation. And so I'll, I'll give you a little bit of a rundown of what I found. Um, but, but, but the short answer is, is that most of what we've been told and led to believe about Chernobyl is incorrect or, or incomplete or just plain wrong. Um, so for instance, Moscow leaders said, oh, and here's what, the, here's what the original book looked like, now they changed the cover. Um, Moscow leaders said that the disaster was safely contained within the Chernobyl zone of alienation. That's a 30 kilometer circle that was um, created right after the accident and depopulated within a couple of weeks. But I found records that pointed to a deliberate contamination outside the zone. Uh, a few days after the accident, a storm front was building up and um, powerful winds were blowing um, from Chernobyl to the northeast and they were heading towards these big Russian cities. So pilots went up and they manipulated the weather to make it rain radioactive fallout on rural Belarus to save the big Russian cities. Mm -hmm. And you could say, okay, that was a triage operation. You know, you, you make it rain on a rural area rather than on big cities. The only problem is that they didn't tell anyone in Belarus that they had done that, not even the Belarusian Communist Party leader. Um, 200,000 people lived in that territory for up to 15 years after the accident in unbelievable levels of radioactivity. And, and you can see here from this map, down there in the lower left-hand corner is where the Chernobyl zone, the Chernobyl plant is. Uh, there's a big city of Gomel there in the middle, and the pilots sort of skipped over Gomel and let it rain just past Gomel to the northeast. And you see um, these angry, hot red spots that are almost as radioactive as right around the plant. Now that's a second Chernobyl zone. It's a Chernobyl zone that no disaster tourist ever visits because nobody really knows about it. But if you were to go to this part of southern Belarus today, you'd see uh, mile after mile of depopulated villages and towns. Um, they told people that they tested the food and they found it was safe. Uh, working in the Ministry of Agriculture records, I found vectors of contaminated food spreading especially where humans congregated. Uh, animals grazed um, under these clouds and they got um, heavily contaminated and Soviet soldiers went in and they confiscated these animals, 50,000 of them, and they slaughtered them. And they probably should have taken those bodies and buried them inside the Chernobyl zone as radioactive waste, but they couldn't stand to do that. You know, the Soviet Union was a hungry country, it was a poor country, 
So they wrote manuals. That's why I call this book Manual for Survival. I came across a lot of manuals. If you're going to farm, this is how you f farm in radioactive conditions. If you're going to produce milk, this is how you filter the radioactivity out of milk, hopefully. And so I found a manual for butchers. This is what you do with the radioactive meat. You take the highest level of radioactive meat and you stu stuff it in a freezer and you wait for it to slowly decay. And the medium and low levels of radioactive meat, you, you mix with clean meat and you make sausage. Mm -hmm. And you, don't, you label it as you normally would, it says in the directions, and you distribute it across the great Soviet Union. But please don't send any to Moscow. Oh. And better to skip Leningrad too. Oh. Now, the, quickly, from the Gomol, meat factory, there's letters going out saying, we need more freezers, we need more freezers, because they had so much high level uh, radioactive meat. And they keep asking for freezers, and they don't get any freezers. So finally they find a train car that's refrigerated, and they shove six tons of radioactive meat in the train car, and they sent it to Baku. Baku, they took out their Geiger counters and they said, we don't want this meat. And they sent it to Armenia, and Armenia sent it to Tbilisi, and on and on. For four years, this car, stuffed with radioactive meat, circled the western half of the Soviet Union, until finally the KGB buried it inside the Chernobyl zone in 1990. Uh, in that secret, Chernobyl uh, area, that second Chernobyl zone down there, up, up there in um, Belarus, I find that most of the food sources that people ate and drank were contaminated. Um, three quarters of milk was over permissible levels. They raised the permissible levels for the emergency, even with those higher levels. Three quarters of the milk was over permissible levels. 22% of mother's milk was over permissible levels. And I think we're talking about a new era in human history when we have permissible levels for mother's milk. Um, in 1988, a quarter of milk was all still too hot to drink, and of 59 wild boar samples, 47 were above permissible levels. Um, all mushrooms were in that category. I could also see from the the radiation map, and this is the map um, later on, about 89, that um, the map made no sense and that hot spots of health problems occurred not just in the red zones on the map, but in places where, with low levels of radiation where no one expected to see any problems. In one case, I found that there were 200 liquidators, and liquidators were Chernobyl people who were um, given, credited with having cleaned up the Chernobyl accident and have received um, exposures from Chernobyl radiation. There was 200 of these liquidators in a wool factory in Chernigov, and Chernigov is right there in the corner. You can see it's pretty clean. It's 50 miles away from the plant, and these were wool workers, women workers for the most part. And I, you know, I was used to thinking of liquidators as the firemen who rushed at, you know, at, you know, shoulders first and fought those radioactive flames, not wool workers 50 miles away in a pretty clean town. I couldn't figure out what had happened, so I finally just got in the car and I drove there and I, and I wanted to go find these wool workers. And I, um, first I talked to the management, and the management said, yeah, we had a problem in 1986 and a commission came from Moscow and they, we changed our process and the problem was solved, no problem. I said, oh yeah, yeah, okay. And so I said, can I go down on the, on the line and, and, and see what it looks like? And they said, sure. And as soon as they, you know, they brought this woman from the, the factory line, and as soon as we were out of hearing of the, of the bosses, she said, you know, I came here, I was 21 with my friend, and within 18 months after 1986, my friend had died of leukemia. And, um, I went and found these women, and there was 10 left from this list of 200, and they said, they found themselves on the list, and they said, oh, there was Maria, yeah, she died, and, and there was, you know, Olga, yeah, she had a, um, a, a problem, and she had to be invalided out, and, and so 10 were left, and it turns out that what they were doing to get this dose was just cleaning and sorting dirty wool, and so every time they picked up a bale of dirty wool, they were hugging something that had 3.2 millirads of radioactivity coming from it. And, th and that's like um, hugging an x-ray machine while it's turned on, oh. and doing it over and over and over all day long. 
Um, these women were, were pretty interesting. They, they had no more than a high school degree, yet I was impressed by their knowledge of radiobiology. They pointed to parts of their bodies that ached or were diseased, and they related to me which isotopes had lodged there, and, and I found that their knowledge of radiobiology was pretty good. Um, they knew where the factory's radioactive wastewater went into the municipal drinking reservoir. Um, I had asked the management about it, they had no memory of it, but these women knew it quite well. And they were right, it bared out from the archives. Now officially, Soviet leaders said they gave medical exams to 900,000 people after the accident and they found no change in health status. Um, officially, Moscow says, and the UN says this to this day, that 300 people were hospitalized from after the accident, and these were firemen and nuclear cleanup workers. Um, I counted in the Ministry of Health records 40,000 people hospitalized in the summer after the accident because of their Chernobyl exposures, a quarter of whom were children. The records show that immediately after the accident, Doctors treated sick children and adults. Uh, they recorded an increase in thyroid problems, complications at birth, birth defects, and infant mortality. Children and pregnant women were especially hard hit. In 1987, half of the children who they um, inspected had enlarged thyroids. 10% had anemia, four times more than the year before, and a year later, 30% had anemia. Heart defects uh, doubled, perinatal deaths, that's deaths within 28 days of birth, doubled in 87, tripled in 88. Among uh, adults, there were cases, increased frequencies of heart disease, thyroid disease, uh, GI tract problems, uh, cataracts, liver and blood disease. All of these numbers usually doubled or tripled depending on the county between 1984 and 1988. Cancer rates climbed from 86 to 89 five times higher per capita in that area of Mogilev Oblast of, of Providence of uh, Belarus than in the rest of the Re Belarusian Republic. Um, and here's some, some people with thyroid cancer. Here's some thing, ways that people visualized it at the time. This is a form that says that we looked at 1,551 kids and of those 1,551 kids, 1,132 had one chronic disease or another around about 80% in most of these regions, kids had some chronic disease after the accident. Here's another one. This is the rates of anemia among children in one county in southern Belarus from 1986 to 1988. And you can see that sort of you know, arrow going right off the charts. Um, now the simple uh, questions of, of fatalities is, Pretty hard to answer. The UN websites say that between 33 and 54 people died from the accident. Greenpeace projected that 900,000 people would eventually die from the accident. So we have a big difference between 33 and 900,000. Um, in Ukraine alone, uh, I found that the Ukrainian government has given compensation to 35,000 people whose spouses have died from a Chernobyl-related illness. That's the minimum number. That just counts people who are old enough to marry, people who were married. Uh, the Ukrainian, Ukrainian official, the government counts that 150,000 people have died so far from the accident. And that's just in Ukraine. Far more radioactivity landed in Russia and Belarus. Those countries have not been courageous enough to take account. Um, now, three years after the accident, none of this was news. Chernobyl was a banned topic in the Soviet media until 1989. And once that story went public, Soviet and international experts in radiation medicine scoffed at the reports of a wide-scale health problems. Um, they said, that's impossible. You know, these doses that these people are getting are far too low, and we know that because we have the Hiroshima and Nagasaki studies. And those, that lifespan study um, produced charts like this. And, and even if you're not a scientist, you might agree with me that this chart doesn't have a lot in the way of, of variables. But what it does is it says if you get a certain amount of sieverts, this is your chance of getting, an extra chance of getting cancers from this kind of dose. And from these charts, the international scientists didn't even really need to go to the Chernobyl zone. They could say, you know, quite safely, according to their medicine and, to, and their science, that n there would be no detectable health effects from Chernobyl-level doses. 
Instead, they said that people might be sick, but that's because they have poor diets, they drink, they smoke, and they're stressed out because of their, they're anxious that they're getting something from Chernobyl. They have what they called radiophobia. Now, facing angry crowds, Soviet officials didn't know what to do. They had all these people who were striking, protesting in the streets in 1989. And so they asked the International Atomic Energy Agency in 19, uh, fall of 1989 to come in and do an independent assessment. And, and you know, these foreign experts were going to come in and tell us what was really wrong. And so about 200 uh, International Atomic Energy Agency consultants came in and they, they worked for about 18 months and they looked at about 1,200 people and um, they said the same thing that the Soviet government had said, the doses are too low, these, we found a lot of extra illness in these areas, but it can't be from Chernobyl. Now I worked to sort out this confusing record. You know, who was right? Was there really a public health disaster among 4 million people that we don't really know anything about? How could a story of that scale have slipped beneath the radar for 30 years? The textual records revealed a lot of contradictions and, and disagreements and conflicting measurements, plus some strange occurrences. I, I noticed that there was three computers at different institutes in the Soviet Union that held the really valuable uh, measurements of the doses that people were getting right after the accidents. And I looked for those records, but I found that all three of those computers had had their hard drives stolen and all the floppy disks with them right in 1990 when these international experts were coming in. And I see correspondence in the KGB saying, we have to make sure that those capitalists don't get our valuable scientific data. So I'm pretty sure the, so the, the KGB uh, took those records and did something with them, and we haven't yet found them. I also found that Soviet officials falsified accounts while KGB agents planted fake news in the media. And um, I, you know, that while I was researching this story, the WikiLeaks and problems with the 2016 elections were going on in this country, and I couldn't help but you know, be influenced by that. And I, I started to worry that people had planted things in the archives you know, way back 30 years ago that I was supposed to find now, and that this is, you know, you know, I worried, archives lie. So how do I get around that? How do I cross-check my sources? Um, and so I, f I tried to figure out how do I do that, and I finally figured out, well, people lie, but maybe trees don't lie. And so I asked, uh, I, I, you know, this accident took place in the Pripyat marshes, which is Europe's largest swamp, and it's got lots of forests and trees. And, um, and I asked a forester to take me in. And, and this is, you know, these pre-pit marshes, I have to tell you a little bit about them. They're, they're really gorgeous. It's a, it's a sort of a bowl, a deep bowl, and it, 17 rivers transect this territory, and there's hundreds of, of lakes and streams. And for two months out of the year, when it floods, traditionally, there's villages in there, the villages would be cut off from the rest of civilization because there would be so much water. Um, 1960s, the Soviet dried up the swamp, parts of it, in order to have more place for fields to grow crops and also to have this, what was going to be Europe's largest nuclear power reactor with 10 reactors at this plant. And that's the Chernobyl plant with the water all around it. Um, and there was just one part of the swamp that was still really swampy, and that's on the Belarusian side, it was called the Almani Swamp. And I asked a forester to take me in. And uh, the reason this swamp is still swampy is because in 1961, the Soviets made an Air Force bombing range there, and they uh, didn't need it to be dried up to bomb it. And so um, the forester took me in, and we, you know, we looked at, we saw a lot of ordnance that was just sitting there, and there was this big tower that the generals used to, you know, stand and watch the flight pass of the pilots, and so I climbed up the tower and, and took a picture. And there was a couple of, of villages that had been evacuated when they created the, the bombing range, and the only thing left of the villages were some graveyards. So he showed me some graveyards, and we're standing around, and I see this one, uh, it's, it's, this picture is, they're not, it's pretty bright in here, but I see this bomb crater, and these pine trees growing out of the bomb crater. And I was looking at the pine trees, and I looked a little closer, and I see this, these, this one pine tree looks really funny. 
you know, pine needles are supposed to grow straight. They're all, they, all pine needles agree to grow in the right direction at the right time. And, and this, this pine needle, they didn't get it. You know, you can see it sort of curling and rounds. And, and biologists would call that sort of a, a, a disorderly pine needles. That they're, and, and they knew that pine, lots of things can cause mutations in pine trees, but radiation is a major factor in that. And I'd seen trees like this in the Chernobyl zone. So I asked the forest, like, how old do you think that pine tree is? And he goes, oh, about 40 years old. I said, well, that's 10 years before Chernobyl. He goes, yeah, it is. And he, and he looked pretty disturbed. And we looked around, and we, and we didn't find any more pine trees growing out of bomb craters, and we didn't find any more mutations in pine trees. Um, so I, I, you know, I put that photograph of the twisty pine needle in my file that I had about uh, rumors of testing of small strategic nuclear weapons in that bombing range in the 1960s. After the Soviet Union uh, collapsed, some big leaders talked about that. I couldn't get into, the, you know, into Moscow, into the records of nuclear testing, because that's off limits to researchers. And, and that's the nature of power, is that if you know, somebody decides they want part of history to disappear, they can, as that history is constituted in archives. But I had other evidence, and, and one was in this published book, that was called the you know, Global Fallout of Cesium-137. Pretty boring title, but I, of course, read it with great fascination. And in the 1960s, this team of researchers went around the Pripyat marshes, especially where that bombing range was, and they tested everything, the soils, the vegetables, the, you know, the fruits and the, from the blueberry bushes, the water, and the bodies of villagers. And they pr produced this map that looks, in a, it's, this map was produced in 1965, five years before they even started to build the Chernobyl plant. But it sure looks a lot like later radiation maps from the Chernobyl accident. And what these researchers were, were specialists in nuclear emergencies in the Soviet Union. Like if these guys showed up in your backyard, you should just walk out your front door and never return. Because they showed up like the Grim Reaper, wherever there was a nuclear emergency. And so they did this four-year study in the Pripyat marshes in the 1960s and produced this map. And so more generally looking at this map, I realized that radioactive contamination predated the even building of the Chernobyl plant. And that to me was a pretty disturbing realization. And I thought that, thinking about that, that um, maybe we should we're, we're doing something wrong by calling Chernobyl an accident. Because when you call something an accident, it implies that there's a beginning, a middle, and an end. And that with that end, there's some closure. But if you think about this, then maybe we should think of Chernobyl as an acceleration on a timeline of exposures that continued, started in 1945 and continue to this day, as Tom could tell you, at Hanford. Um, and with that, I think, um, we start to see something quite different. Um, a set of occurrences that are in flux uh, that shape the present and future as I try to write about them. And that's what it made Chernobyl kind of a different and slippery topic to write about. Um, take time, for instance. Uh, scientists have been saying for 100 years that time is a human construct, that time the way we constituted, tipped off in seconds, uh, is, isn't really quite right, that time expands and contracts in unpredictable ways. And the Chernobyl story sort of validates that, in that you know, it, there was a, a big um, forest, let me get to that forest. This is called the Red Forest, and um, they call it the Red Forest because it took the hardest hit of radioactivity after the accident. And um, the, the pine trees, which are very vulnerable to radio, radioactivity, they die. They turn red and died. And then foresters came in and they chopped down the, the pine trees. And then the pine trees fell over. 25 years later, when some biologists showed up in the red forest, they found that those pine trees were still sitting there. They hadn't decomposed. They should have turned to dust in about 10 years. But they couldn't turn to dust because there wasn't enough microbes and bugs that do the work of decomposition. So for an historian, that was really sort of striking. That, you know, if Rumpelstiltskin had fallen asleep and woken up 25 years later, he wouldn't have known how much time had passed. You know, historians are always trying to 
freeze frame the past in order to get a fix on it. And here I was, finally time had frozen. I was not filled with joy, but with dread at experiencing that. Um, and there was also the reverse is true, that people who were exposed, and animals who were exposed to Chernobyl contamination, experienced a rapid radiation aging. For them, time sped up. And so you see this time expanding and contracting. Um, so these problems of time led me to continue to search for other ways other than text to try to understand this accident. So I asked these two biologists, Tim Musso and Andres Moller, the only two biologists I could find who work consistently in the zone. They've been going there since 2000. They go every June and every September. And I asked if I could join them on their uh, research trips to try to figure out if I could learn more about radio ecology. And they were generous enough to take me along on their trips and I learned a lot from them. Um, what you most often hear, like if you're, if you're a fan of, of Nat Geo specials, is that the Chernobyl zone is thriving. It's filled with animals, that animals prefer radiation to humans, and that, you know. But I didn't find that to be the case. Um, in fact, here we have a, a poor BBC reporter told to go get that story, the Chernobyl Zone is Thriving story, and she can't find any animals to photograph in the wild, but that's okay because they have some penned up animals and you can just take a picture of it and then you can, that can appear in your special story, right? But as we worked our way through the zone, um, what I found was all kinds of interesting things that these biologists taught me. Um, what they found is that the Chernobyl zone is not sort of a uniformly radioactive area, that radioactivity differs in four orders of magnitude. And that in the really um, hot spots, they found that insects and especially pollinators completely disappeared. Without pollinators, the fruit, the blossoms on the fruit trees weren't pollinated, and so there was less fruit. With less fruit, there were fewer frugivores, so they found um, 60 percent depression in the populations of birds in these hot areas. Without frugivores, there was no seeds to be spread around, so they found all of three fruit trees had seeded after 1986. So what they were describing was a whole cascade of extinction that was occurring in these areas. Every rock we turn over, Musso said, we find damage. In 2017, I was with them and we went into the Red Forest. And I had been hoping when I worked with them that I would avoid having to go into the Red Forest. It's still the most radioactive place in the Chernobyl area. But I was like, I agreed to do what they were doing, so off I went. And the Red Forest is pretty ugly even today. Um, here's some pine trees down there. They're, they're trying to be pine trees, but they're bushes. They're pine bushes because they um, have these mutations and they get confused. This pine tree was planted to grow board straight to make lumber for our houses, but it's not board straight, um, obviously. So I had expected about 50 uh, microsieverts an hour. That's, that's already uncomfortably too radioactive for me. But as we walked along, my Geiger counter was suddenly like screeching, and it was you know, measuring closer to 1,000 microsieverts an hour. And um, I asked Tim, like, what's going on? Why, why is my... Geiger kind of going off like this. And he said, oh yeah, last fall there was a forest fire in the red forest and all the radioactivity that was stored in the leaf litter and in the, in the trees and in the wood went up in smoke and it re-volatized and created a, a nuclear event that I checked the media, nobody really covered this story. Here's a pretty major nuclear event that International Atomic Energy Agency would have ranked at a level five emergency, but no one covered it. Um, and I think that's the problem with long radioactive half-lives. It's the same with other chemical toxins, that the scale, the time scales stretch beyond the capacity of social memory and human attention. If the crooked tree in the swamp shows that how radioactivity predated Chernobyl, this forest fire in 2017 shows how it kept going. And, and KGB agents reported dozens of accidents in Ukraine at nuclear power reactors in the 1990s after 1986. These same KGB agents also fretted up about how to clean up nuclear accidents. And, and cleaning up nuclear accidents is also environmentally, environmentally toxins. They poured heavy metals on the burning reactor. That went up in smoke. Um, they applied nitrogen fertilizers and lots of pesticides to deal with um, struggling crops. 
They use chemical agents to spray down roads and buildings and to try to remove the radioactivity from them. And unfortunately, these engineered solutions to the disaster mostly failed. Despite awe-inspiring efforts to cleanse the landscape of radioactive isotopes, by 1990, Soviet leaders had to sort of cry uncle and say, we can't handle this. Um, they had to admit that the biological was too much, that um, people in these territories were getting too much radioactivity, mostly in their food supplies. So they said in 1990 they're going to resettle 200,000 more people. 120,000 had originally been resettled. But before these new rounds of resettlement could occur, the Soviet Union collapsed, and there was no money or political will to move anybody. And just as that happened, UN agencies came in to manage the disaster, and they did these studies, the one I was just talking about, and they said there's, there's no problem. These people are fine. We, can't, we looked, we did a big study, health study, and we couldn't find any sign of disease. Uh, and we won't find any in the future, so there's no reason to move these people. Um, and they were also trying to raise money at the UN for a big, long-term epidemiological study of the Chernobyl health effects. Mm -hmm. Same UN key opinion makers said, no, that's not necessary. Please don't fund any Chernobyl programs. If you want to give money to East Europe, fine, but not for Chernobyl programs, because it's not needed. It's not necessary. Mm. Um, now, meanwhile, these same UN researchers had, you know, created a study designed to find catastrophic results, and they had found catastrophic results. They found a big cancer epidemic among children, and they were actually given all these biopsies to, and they didn't believe that these Soviet doctors, crappy doctors, could really diagnose thyroid cancer among children. So they brought the, th the biopsies home. One guy brought them home to New Mexico. The biopsies checked out. They were indeed thyroid cancer. That thyroid cancer among kids is really rare, one in a million. Suddenly in a small area of Ukraine, 20 kids have it, 30 kids in Belarus. Um, and what did the scientists do? They lost that evidence. They didn't report it in their report. They said we, we, there were some rumors of thyroid cancer among kids, but those rumors turned out to be anecdotal. Um, so with that, n nothing happened. There was no study, and these people didn't get moved. Um, and as the post-Soviet economic crisis deepened, subsidies for clean food and monitoring withered away, and with the new neoliberal orientation of Ukraine and Belarus in the 1990s, it was ideologically easier to abandon people to their own fate on contaminated ground. And we see this globally as more and more people live in environments saturated with toxins, risk has been privatized. Now the constriction of the social welfare state and the planet in a state of ecological stress is a correlation. Whether there's a connection, I think is something that we should not leave to scientists alone to decide, that we should get involved in those issues. Now, as scientists in the West announced the end of history in the 1990s, the people on Chernobyl contaminated ground were left to carry on alone. They ate what they produced, having few other options. In one of the few studies of birth defects, a researcher in northern Ukraine, uh, Vladimir Vrdolecki, uh, found six times more neuro tube birth defects than the European norm in that northern region of Ukraine, right where that swamp was where I was um, went there with the forester. Now that jump in birth defects could be, and, and neural tube disorders include spinal, spinal, diffida, spinal bifida and anencephaly. And this is um, anencephaly. Now, there are babies born with, with very small brains or no brain at all, and it's a, it's a fatal birth defect. This photograph comes from the, the Mayak area where the plutonium plant was. I don't know if you're aware, but in eastern Washington to this right now, since 2010, there's been this huge spike in babies born with anencephaly, especially in the counties surrounding the, the Hanford plant. Now, the Washington State Health Department did a study. They spent a year doing a study, and they thought maybe radiation was a problem, but then they were told by the Department of Energy that radiation doesn't leave the site, that somehow cyclone fencing holds radioactivity inside the nuclear reservation. So they said, well, it can't be from that. We don't know what the problem is, and they closed the case. Um, 
But so these same uh, anencephalic babies showed up in the Chernobyl area, and you know, and who knows what that jump in birth defects was caused by. It could be from Chernobyl contamination. It could be from Chernobyl and nitrates that they poured into the soil to help the crops after the accident. It could be from Chernobyl and pre-1986 Chernobyl explosions that were passed down epigenetically to the offspring. Um, my tour through the Pripyat marshes showed that these areas that these scientists explored are filled with um, charred remnants pitted with the deposits of spent ammunition and heavy metals and chemical toxins and radioactive uh, waste distributed at a frenetic pace in the course of the 20th century. Now you might respond to this information saying, oh, I feel empathy for those people in Ukraine, those people out there in that other country far away. And that's how I was trained to think of history, uh, as something that plays out largely within national borders. But now that we have an awareness of the planetary scale of human actions, a cognizance, that cognizance diminishes the importance of national boundaries. Those events out there make it home. And, and let me tell you what I, what I have in mind when I'm talking about this. I was traveling in northern Ukraine a couple of years ago and I see all these people, thousands of people collecting berries from the forests and the swamps. And they were selling the berries. Uh, it was a big operation. They would, they'd come out of the forest with their baskets of berries and they'd sell them to these middle women who were on the streets and they would buy right on the road the berries from the pickers. And, and so my research assistant and I, we decided to go undercover blueberry picking. Probably the most dangerous thing I did while I re researched this book. And here I am happily selling my berries. And um, then we followed the, the, the buyers to the warehouse. And we got to the warehouse and there was this nice lady who's buying all the berries and, and she bought our berries and our berries, um, she measured, and she measured all the berries that came in for radioactivity. And I asked her, you know, how many of these berries are radioactive? And she said, all the berries are radioactive. <laughs> but some are really, really radioactive, 3,000 becquerels a kilogram. And the, the norm, the permissible level in Ukraine at the time was 450 becquerels per kilogram. So this was 3,000. So ours were only 350. And so she bought our berries happily, but we stood around and, and I noticed that she bought all the berries, the ones that were cleaner and the ones that were over the permissible levels. And, and they were in two different piles, over here and over there. And so I said, you know, I asked the pickers, why are they buying all the berries? And again, it was like, you know, stupid American, stupid American. Of course they buy all the berries. They buy our dirtier berries at lower prices and then they mix them with the cleaner berries and they get to the norm. Mm. So, now the berries, after they're purchased, they go to, the, in 2014, Ukraine joined the European Union Association, so they have the right to ship their agricultural <laughs> produce to the EU, and they cross the border into the EU. 20,000 tons a year, and that number grows each year. And then they, the pickers go back and they pick cranberries in August and mushrooms in the fall. Mm. Um, and you're still probably saying, well, that bully for the Europeans. They wake up in the morning, they spend extra money on wild organic berries, and they get one that's 3,000 becquerels a kilogram. But I was talking to a guy in homeland nuclear security, borderland security, and he's like, yeah, yeah, we had a truck coming over the border from Canada to the U.S., and inside it was a radiating mass. You know how those guys talk? Radiating mass. I said, oh, really, what was it? berries from Chernobyl. So well, what did you do with them? He goes, well, they were within the permissible levels, which in the U.S. is 1250 becquerels a kilogram, and so we let them in. So now you all have that problem, and you're probably fine if you eat a berry with 3,000 becquerels a kilogram. And that's what the a health physicist would tell you, is everybody's got a little bit of man-made radioactivity in their bodies, you're fine. Um, but I think um, this point underlies what I have found, that, that the Chernobyl accident serves as only an exclamation point in a chain of toxic exposures that have remastered the landscape and our societies and bodies, including our bodies. Describing Chernobyl just as an accident is a broom that sweeps away this larger story around it, which is more important. And I think one reason there's been so little research on Chernobyl health effects is that 
Funding agencies and scientists have thrown up their hands at the complexity of solving, of sorting out all these different layers of, of toxins that are there in the environment since the 1950s. And I think another reason for the paucity of research I found working through five UN archives, UN agency archives, is that UN agents work to minimize the story of a public health disaster. I found them hide, hiding biopsies, burying data, slandering and discrediting and trying to fire opposing scientists. And you might ask, why would they try to do that? What's, why would UN agencies or international uh, experts, scientists, try to help out the Soviet Union? But you know, I realize that the UN officials serve their client states, and their client states are the big nuclear powers, the UK, US, France, Russia. And in the 1990s, these countries were facing big lawsuits from their own legacies of having produced nuclear weapons and tested them. Um, now, if you were a UN or, or somebody working for the Department of Energy and you could say, look, Chernobyl accident, world's worst nuclear accident, and only 33 people died, then those lawsuits could just disappear. And that's indeed exactly what happened. Those big lawsuits and there's pe you know, people in the Marshall Islands, uh, the Americans were the only people, the only country in the world that had the temerity to put a nuclear, to test nuclear weapons in the heartland. Everybody else put their uh, weapons testing places in their colonies. Um, Australia, Western Australia was hit by British weapons and South Pacific and Algeria by French nuclear testing. Um, so I think what we see from Chernobyl is um, an acceleration in a half century in which the US and the, and the Soviet Union alone released not 45 million curies of radioactive iodine, that's what the Chernobyl number is, but 20 billion curies of radioactive iodine just from testing from those two countries alone. Now radioactive iodine goes to the thyroid and it causes cancers and thyroid disease, hormonal problems, and endocrine system disorders. And here again, scale confounds the issue. Global fallout spread after 1951, mostly in the Northern Hemisphere, and in the same decade, rates of cancers, uh, especially childhood cancers, once a medical rarity, increased in the Northern Hemisphere. So too did birth defects, fertility problems, thyroid and pediatric cancers continue to rise. Um, male sperm counts since 1945, again, in the Northern Hemisphere, have dropped in half. And here's some charts um, that show these sort of rises, and you see these dramatic rises. Um, now, these diminished human health indicators um, became the new background against which Chernobyl health statistics were measured. It's sort of a sliding background problem. Um, in other words, uh, the scale of possible damage from the Chernobyl problems has, has fully saturated our existence so that we can't even really see it any longer. Um, so let me just um, leave you with this one thought. I, I hope you see now how, like these guys on the right were nuclear cleanup workers, but also so is this girl with the blue lips picking berries in the forest is a nuclear waste worker one without any kind of medical monitoring or any kind of dosimetry. Um, and I think that's you know, the sort of shame that um, these berries go all around the world. When the, you know, despite all kinds of efforts to use to engineering and chemicals to try to clean up radioactivity from the environment, that didn't work. But these berries are incredible. And so are the mushrooms and so are the cranberries. They have this ability to clean up radioactivity from the soils. We could use them as our allies, right? We could take them, and rather than sending them around the globe for all of us to eat, we could pay these pickers $25 a day and then bury them as radioactive waste. And the, the disaster tourists who love to go to the zone and have their stag parties, they might better be, they might even love to go pick radioactive berries and take selfies with, of themselves as they dump those radioactive berries in nuclear waste repositories. What I'm trying to say is I think that if we approach this situation with our eyes wide open, 
we can come up with much better solutions than pretending there is no problem at all. Thank you. I missed what made the swamp radioactive before Chernobyl. The scientists who did the study said it was from global fallout, mostly from American bombs. Um, that was a censored study. You know, it was, you know the, the study I read had been censored. Uh, my guess is that it was from testing of, of small strategic nuclear weapons in that swamp. Is there any uh, possibility that cores of the trees could provide information about the level of radioactivity at different times? Yeah, there, you know, the, the, the biologists I worked with have, have done a little bit of that, where they, um, they see you know, every year a, a new ring grows, and what they see is a, a real slowing of the growth of the ring. So they can usually like, they, 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 you know, look at a trees and the, the rings of the trees, and they can say, oh, that's 1986 right there, and because it, you know, the tree's growing, it's growing along pretty well, and then it just stops growing slowly like that. But that's a great, that points to a great question, which is where I think radiobiology and radiation medicine should go is rather than sort of take measurements in the environment and then extrapolate and, and do dose estimates and guess how much radioactivity people got, we could look for biomarkers. And the Ru Russian science is actually, Soviet science was really good at doing this, looking at chromosome markers and things like that to be able to calculate dose. And Soviet doctors did that because they, they didn't have access to, the, to radiation levels because they were, that was classified information. So they learned to read bodies, um, kind of like an archive. And, and that, I think, is it's actually pretty good science. And that was all wiped away when the Soviet Union fell apart, but I think it should be revived. Thanks for your research. Um, I was mm. wondering what the uh, media response to the book has been, and if you've gotten any, do you ever have a chance to have dialogue with any responsible government authorities? Mm. So far, no, I haven't. Um, the response has been, for the most part, good. Like, about three quarters of the of the reviews are are good um, in the popular media. About a quarter are are really, really not good, <laughs> not good at all. And uh, so I've pissed off some industry scientists and some and pro nuclear people, and um, you know, to be expected. Hi, um, I remember viewing this National Geographic um, piece that you mentioned about nature thriving. Um, so that's really interesting to hear your perspective of that being sort of, a, of an inaccurate story. What do you speculate would be their um, reason for going all in on that story? It's a new story. You know, it was a new story as of 2015 when this um, scientist James Smith um, published an article. It was a two-page article, it's just a letter. And then he published another article, so two articles. Th these guys I followed have published 2,000 articles. Um, so there's far more evidence that we have that Chernobyl Zone is not thriving. But I think the media just loves that story because it, it, you know, it'd be great if nature just took care of our problems for us without, you know, humans just walk away. And it, it's sort of like that, you know, the Department of Energy in the United States makes wildlife preserves out of every former nuclear site. And they, you know, these are really strange wildlife preserves, you know, because it, like at the Fernald um, in Ohio, there's, you know, you go in, there's a cyclone fence around it, and you get a little brochure when you go in, and it says, welcome, enjoy nature, this is a green site, but, but please, when you're here, make sure you stay only on the gravel path. Your dog cannot go anywhere near that pond. And if you find a piece of mortar or a brick that looks like this or like this, do not touch it. So like suddenly we have very strange nature at these places. But, but that narrative is that you know, nature restores itself. And in fact, there was the Hanford Reach. And it's thank God for Hanford, it, it created this one last free-flowing spot of the Columbia River. Um, is, you know, is a, you know, my suspicion is this something that was, was created by lobbyists on K Street in my hometown of Washington, and that that you know, was exported to Chernobyl. I'm, I'm very stunned by the whole story. I've never heard anything about the meat and the blueberries and the distributing them to make them. It's just insane. Um, but when we get those, are, is the meat still being processed? Are there still animals that are exposed that are being fed to the people? The blueberries obviously 
will continue for whatever as long as those bushes are contaminated. But is there any? Yeah, the wild meat, the wild boars, uh, the reindeer is up in you know up in the north. Um, that meat is still highly contaminated. You know, I don't. You know, I tried to get to the into the Gomel meat factory, and um, the woman who answered the phone when I asked about contaminated Chernobyl meat when I called up in Belarus, um, she could not get off the phone fast enough. Um, <laughs> so I don't know about now about um, the meat that's produced around there. The milk is still radioactive that's produced around there. And wh where does that supply go to? Mostly Russia. I'm learning throughout what we've been thinking about this stuff. What about climate change? Do you think that, you know, I know that you know, radiation is spread all over the globe and a hot spot. Do you have any thoughts about what's the climate So for climate change, should we use nuclear power to, yeah, right. for climate change? Yeah. I, you know, I, I just don't, it doesn't make any sense to me. You know, to build a nuclear power plant takes 20 years at best. The new fusion reactors, they, you know, they've been saying that's, that's new technology is just around the corner, but they've been saying that since the 1950s, right? Um, we need an estimated 12,000 nuclear reactors to solve climate change. 12,000. We have 408 plugged in right now. So that's a big scale. So that means there'll be a nuclear reactor right there, and there'll be another one on the other side of Seattle, and we'd all have to live with nuclear reactors in, you know, in our environments. And I don't see the public buying into that. Nuclear reactors are fine in theory if they're way out in Idaho, if they're on some Indian reservation in northern Minnesota, but not if they're next to my city. Um, and then the other problem with nuclear energy, just you know, without the safety and the health problems, is that um, they produce an awful lot of heat. You know, you, you, you heat up water to generate electricity, but they're about 30% efficient, and the rest of it just goes up in heat. So do we want 12,000 really hot things on the globe? I mean, they're really hot. So I, to fight global warming. To fight global warming. You know, so I don't really understand. I mean, if somebody could cogently explain to me why this makes sense and how it's going to solve the problems that we need to solve tomorrow. We, I mean, we could put solar panels on this roof tomorrow, but we could not put a nuclear reactor anywhere near here for the next 20 years, at best, if you could get the Seattleites to agree to it. And I have a feeling that's not going to happen easily. So I don't know what I don't know what I don't know what they're up to, honestly. It seems wacky to me. Perfectly intelligent people are saying wacky things, <laughs> as far as I'm concerned. Hi, thanks, Kate. Um, I'm really interested in these women. The, uh, the women who are in the meat factory seem you indicated have a pretty sophisticated understanding of the isotopes and the impact it was having on them. And, so for them and for these berry pickers and all, what, what's their consciousness around it? Is it a fatalistic view? Uh, just an acceptance of what is? Yeah. Yeah, I'm trying to find them. But they, they understand the impact that it's having on it. Yeah, everybody there does. Yeah. You know, nobody's, nobody thinks, nobody in Ukraine or Belarus or Western Russia thinks 35 people died from Chernobyl. They all know 35 people who've died from Chernobyl themselves personally. Um, no, I mean, this, isn't, this is a book that was not written necessarily for East Europe because it, that's, they're well aware of it. And, you know, they get in real trouble. Like there's, they, they, they're coming and going. They, they can't. So, you know, during the 1990s when they said, we're sick, we're sick from Chernobyl, they were called radiophobic. Then when, you know, years go on and they're left to, these, to live there and all they can do there is farm, they're called nuclear fatalists because they eat radioactive food. And so, like, one way or the other, they're screwed, you know. They're, they're just, you know, dumb villagers who don't know how to handle the situation. Um, but I don't see, you know, like one clear indicator of what was going on is right, right away, 1986, 87, all these areas where, the, where there's a lot of contamination, the doctors just emptied out. The hospitals were staffed at 50%. They just could not keep doctors. They'd send young doctors in. They'd immediately move away or they wouldn't go, they wouldn't even show up for work. Um, so the people who knew best were, are out of there, and the, you know, the people who are left behind are the, the people with the fewest options. You had mentioned that uh, countries in the area didn't have the courage to look at the health issues, and I'm wondering if you could talk about that a little bit more. Is that related to the lack of infrastructure to even take care of health issues? So if you find additional health burdens and you don't have the facilities to care for the people, or is it something more than that? 
Mm -hmm. Well, you know, it, the, initially, and this is what's so amazing about the Chernobyl archival record, is that the Soviets went in, they sent in thousands of doctors, Ukraine alone, 9,000 doctors, and they mobilized them to look at people. And, look at, and they also sent in thousands of radiologists to gather data about how much radiation was in the soils, and the waters, and the air, and the food. And so all that data for the you know, first five years after the accident is there. And we don't have information like that about any other site in the world. Because nobody's ever had the courage to do that. Maybe the Marshall Islands, they did a little bit. Holly is a specialist in the Marshall Islands bombing. They did that a little bit with the Brookhaven Labs you know, study. Uh, and that was all classified. And th so the Soviets did that on a mass level for the first five years. But then the Soviet Union fell apart. And they said the UN took over. And they were trying to raise a billion dollars in today's money, um, half of which would have gone for a long-term health study. Because scientists all around the world thought, this is really important. Like, most people are not going to be exposed to radiation in the Hiroshima way from a bomb blast. Most people are going to be exposed chronic, long-term, low doses. That's a more plausible situation for most of us. And so they wanted to do a study, and, and scientist after scientist popped up to do, you know, said, we need to do this study. And that's exactly what has not happened. And that's from, yes, I think a lack of courage. You know, they, you know what if we find something? Who's going to pay for it? Who's going to be liable? Who's going to move those people and, and find them alternative jobs? Hi, thank you so much for your talk. Um, I just wanted to ask a question about um, comparing um, Hanford and Chernobyl and the current workers' comp situation happening with the Hanford cleanup workers, and if you had any information about um, anything in, that happened in Chernobyl with the cleanup workers or any associated workers like the women um, in the picture. <coughs> yeah, really similar story in that you know the workers. You know, when you interview them, they say, you know, we were told that, you know, we give our all to our country. We throw our lives on the line to save our country. And our country will take care of us. And here I am, I'm in a wheelchair, and I'm broke, and I, all my money goes to medical bills, and my government hasn't helped me at all. And so it's, yeah, I mean, it's, you know, people are disposable like other things, too. I have a question. Um, you write in your book about some of the levels of radioactivity from nuclear weapons testing in the United States. Could you, uh, in the 50s and 60s, could you talk about that a little bit? Yeah, I mean, what's amazing is that um, 1955, the Atomic Energy Commission writes a report and says, you know, the, the most radioactive spot on the Earth right now is in Minnesota. And that's because you know, they're testing, they're blowing up bombs in Nevada, and the wind's going north, and then it switches to go east, you know, and across the Dakotas. And the first place it rains is Minnesota. And the winds bring the radioactivity around the globe, and the rains bring that radioactivity down to the ground. And um, you know, it, it's just astounding, really, if, if we look back on it. I mean, the, there's, again, only thyroid, because it's, it's pretty uh, unimpeachable. We know that radioactive iodine causes thyroid cancer. So the National Cancer Institute has done one study, and that's on um, a, a big dose of reconstruction from those exposures from Nevada testing. Um, and that's just exposures just from Nevada testing. Of course, like while those people were sitting in Minnesota, they're also getting radioactivity from Soviet testing and from French testing and from British testing, right? But they always just count one source. And that's a way to sort of minimize and conscript you know, the effects. Um, but so they, you know, the NCI conservatively estimated that there's been over 250,000 cancers caused by, you know, that Nevada testing, um, and so you know th that is one of these things that we've not really dealt with in this country. Is you know, if, if we look at these rising rates, really radically rising rates of cancers in our in this country, and the primary cause of infant death becomes birth defects around about 1951. It used to be from viruses and infections. We're not asking, I think we need to ask questions of our, of our leaders and of our scientific establishment. Why is that the case? I mean, yes, we should work really hard to find cures for cancers, but we should also work just as hard to find out what the cause of cancer is. And if you look at the history of cancer, in the 1950s they tried to find a virus that caused cancer. In the 1990s they spent a lot of money trying to find the genes to cause cancer. 
We know that two-thirds of cancers are caused by environmental things. But so what has been this trend is to try to um, have sort of a, neo, a new neoliberal orientation of medicine to, you know, if you have cancer, it must be your fault. You did something wrong. You, you, you're crappy genes. You ran into a virus. You smoked, you drank, something like that. It's your fault. Um, so that, that, of course, clears the polluters from any kind of liability and damage. And um, I think we need to press our leaders to try to, to you know, to, to have a real emphasis to look at the environmental causes of cancer. It's the biggest killer of Americans. Yeah, that's a great question. You know, I was amazed when I heard about that fire. It was like pretty predictable what would happen if there was a fire in the Red Forest. Why not just have sprinklers there? Spend some money and have some sprinklers to make sure there was never a fire again in the Red Forest. I don't see that happening. You're right. The trees are wonderful uh, radioactive storage spots. Right? We, it's another problem we can't seem to solve is how do, where do we store radioactivity? We could store it in trees. Right? And then make sure that those trees, as they decompose slowly, are someplace where they won't you know, s uh, slip into the water table. Um, but th I don't see that happening. But again, if, if we face this problem with our eyes wide open, we could think of really great solutions where we use nature as our ally. One of the things I like the best about Utopia was uh, hearing the stories about your interviews with people and kind of uh, the narratives that people tell themselves to kind of get them through what they're experiencing and then your techniques of both listening to those narratives and breaking through them to kind of get to the real story. Could you talk a little bit more about how you go about developing trust, how you go about empathizing with people, and how you go about kind of doing those interviews and getting that information? Mm -hmm. uh, I don't know. I just... Um I just go, you know, like for instance, um, in this story, there was all these people who wrote over in the 1980s to their government leaders, and those letters I found in the archives, and they had their names and their addresses. And so I had my research assistant try to find those people today. And so when, when we found, I mean, if we could find that they were still in the same locations, we got in the car and we had this list of places, and we went and just stopped and said, you know, you wrote this letter. In 1988, you know, do you still stand by what you wrote and what's happened to your life since then? So that was one way I, I sort of got um, into um, the story, into meeting people. And then once you meet a few people, they, they're like, well, you really need to talk to this person over here, and, and you just keep going. Um, I don't find it's much of a problem to build trust. I mean, people seem to want to tell their stories. Um, another thing I did is, you know, the, the bus service is terrible, that, especially in Belarus, they've cut back on the bus service. So there's all these, especially women and children waiting at bus stops with their thumbs out looking for a ride. So I pick people up. Mm. And then people, you know, you're on long country roads, and people just start telling stories. And this is, I didn't put this in the book because it's, I knew I, it would be called anecdotal evidence. Um, but every person I picked up, and they were, I only picked up women and children, uh, was coming to or from a medical clinic. And they're like, yeah, my kid's, got, my kid's just never been right, or you know, I've got, I just had heart surgery, you know, 18 year old, or you know, things like that. Oh. Mm -hmm. So that was another you know, way that um, I, I got to know people, and I, I, I heard stories. And, um, and then I, you know, I consciously think as I'm writing my books, you know, what can I, you know, it's pretty boring to read about somebody who's just sitting in archives. And so I think, you know, oh, if I go blueberry picking, that would be something interesting to write about. And if I follow these biologists around, I, you know, I'll learn something, but I'll also be a good way to write about this story. So I try to do things that are interesting, you know, sort of narratively for my books to make them interesting to read. Maybe I have time for one more question. Thank you so much for your books and your work. And um, I think we all leave here being really inspired by your, your work and wanting to 
tell people to get your books, but also to try to talk to other people about these stories and, and try to get, convince them that we have some real problems on our, our hands and we need to find solutions. And many of us have friends and neighbors and people that we work with on the east side of the mountains. Mm -hmm. And it's not the bubble of Seattle. Right. So they have very different points of view. And one of the things that I took away from your Plutopia book was that people in Tri-Cities and Chernobyl area are basically paid to like that life. They're paid to agree with what the government has done to them and to allow that to be shoveled into the rough. How do we talk to those people who have been paid to think a different way? It's a great question. Um, and that's the million dollar question, I think. Um, you know, people, you know, I watched it when I worked um, on the Richland story, is that people change their minds once they have tragedies strike their family, but not always, right? Sometimes they can be real stalwart, even when um, can't, multiple cancers have hit their families and other problems. Um, I think what, what works, you know, what makes Plutopia work is that um, people are not just being bribed and paid, but they're being offered a better life, and especially social mobility for their children. So I'm doing all this work at the plant. I'm a working class person. But I, my kids get to go to this great high school here in Richland where PhDs teach, and they're going to have social mobility. So I'm not doing this for my own you know, greedy reasons. I'm doing it for the, my children. And so I'm an altruistic person. So I think that appealing to people's altruistic sides, not calling them, you know, dirty, low-down polluters, helping the man, but, you know, appealing to their sense of, like, making this world a better place might be a, a good starting point. And however strategies you can find to do that. All right. Well, thank you, Kate. Yeah.